um, on having to deal with a topic that really revolves around the history uh, of astronomy. And my style is to keep it open to the questions. You can stop me. Um, I'll draw a line and throw in eggs. <laughs> make it a lively debate um, and I'd really like your, your input uh, and your comments. Um, I'm speaking on, on debunking astrology. Funny topic for a society that's based on science. Um, and before I go on with it, I want to just ask you, each of you, can you just indicate to me what your star sign is, I'll run through them. Who's Aries? Yeah, who's Aries? Uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> Cancer? Libra? Sagittarius, a few of you, and Pisces, fish, a few of you. Who of you don't know what your star sign is? actually change every 76 years or so. So you may actually slip under another sign. But we'll come to that. Okay, you can just ask if there are any acquaintances here. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I was just about to say that. Acquaintances, no acquaintances. Yes, there are. I actually see that. Oh, you? Yeah. Oh, okay. going to do this evening? Debunking Astrology 101. It's a big subject, let me tell you, it's a very big subject. I'm going to start off by giving you definitions of astrology and astronomy, we'll define the subject. Um, the history of astrology, which is fascinating, um, I'll give an overview of the history, then we'll take some very <coughs> famous astronomers and I'm going to emphasize their work in astrology. And we'll see as we go on why I'm doing that. I'm going to entertain you with uh, the role of astrology in literature and in music. Uh, an area that I've been interested in is, is medicine and astrology. Uh, we'll discuss that as well. It's also a very interesting topic. The one that surprises me always is politics and the role of astrology in politics. So we're going to have some input in that area. Uh, we'll look at some of the studies of showing just the prevalence of the belief in astrology uh, throughout the world. Um, then the majority of the talk will really revolve around debunking um, astrology do it yeah, in uh, three ways. One, talk about some of the very famous ancient or antiquity um, uh, philosophers, uh, 
scientists who were against astrology. We looked at some of the psychological experiments that we've done um, uh, and question how astrology became important and why in the mind today it's still important and we'll debunk the whole theory of astrology giving you a um, logical argument the logic behind the debunking of the subject let's start with definitions I must start by saying to you that in antiquity there was no difference between astrology and astronomy they were the same thing it was one word, astrolog astrologia, and it involved astronomy and astrology. It was the same thing. It's only the 17th century where we get the splitting off of the two, and we get astrology and astronomy. But before then, and that's why the history is so interesting, they were the same, it was the same subject. There was no difference between astrology and astronomy. Astrology <coughs> is the study of the movement and relative positions of the celestial objects and their supposed influence on human affairs. So, depending where <coughs> the planets and the stars are, um, and when you're born, influences your personality um, and influences everything around you. That is astrology. It is a pseudo-science. Pseudo means false. It is a false science. It is not science. Astronomy, on the other hand, and this society is involved in astronomy, it's a branch of science, scientific, which deals with the celestial objects, space, and the physical universe as a whole. So today, there's a clear distinction between to the majority of people believe that. There are, however, some believers still who would say there is no difference. The same thing. So those are the definitions. Let's give you a, an historical overview. You know, the oldest known reference to astrology comes from uh, the Venus tablet um, of uh, Amisaduka. We're looking at around 1700 BCE, and there, there it is, there's a picture of it. It's a stone uh, tablet uh, with the first references ever uh, to astrology. So you're looking around sort of 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. A long time ago, that's when people started writing down, <coughs> documenting uh, astrology. The Greeks were the <coughs> early ones to embrace this from about 1950 to 1650 <coughs> BCE, before Christ. Um, and it was the Greeks who gave us the signs of the zodiac. Going back quite a long time. Chinese astrology was very important. The Zhao dynasty, uh, the Han dynasty, got this yin-yang philosophy and brought together uh, divination, astrology, and alchemy. Well, they were all combined, actually, as a pseudoscience. Um, and we're coming right up there to the birth of Christ. And then afterwards, we get Hindu astrology from the Parashastra, 7th century. So Islam um, comes after the Hindu one, the Islamic one, was the Mashallah. And the Mashallah was a document that actually, believe it or not, was the one that elected when the uh, city of Baghdad should be formed. They, it was done on an astrological prediction. They worked out that this is the time that we should form the city of Baghdad. And that's uh, from the history of Baghdad interesting, uh, quite an interesting um, fact. Um, if we look at European, um, the history of the European astrology, the first astrological book written was the book of the planets and regions of the world 
and this was uh, done around 1010 uh, in the common era. So now we're getting moving up in time. Um, then there were a lot of religious writings. Uh, Thomas Aquinas and all the writings around this time were trying to reconcile astrology and religion. They so we, we worked them together. Um, Udo Manatti, 13th century uh, mathematician, <coughs> he was the most famous astrologer. And he wrote this book, Liber Astronomicus, uh, which is on astrology, 13th century. At that time, the advances in astronomy were motivated, motivated by a desire to improve astrology. So people started studying astronomy so that they would improve their predictions in astrology. <laughs> Interesting. The two were so importantly linked and the one advanced the other. Nostradamus, you've all heard, we're going to speak about Rani and Kepler and Galileo, famous, famous astronomers, also famous, famous astrologers, maybe. A zenith of astrology occurs in the 17th century, so the 1600s. Um, astrologers were theorists, they were researchers. <coughs> they were social engineers. Astrology underpinned a system in which everything was understood to be interconnected and it coexisted with religion, magic, science, alchemy. All of it together. That was the way things were. Fascinating stuff. Now, and I'm not doing, I'm doing this anachronistically. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time about, with, about some famous astronomers. I mean, and when I say famous, it's really modern astronomy rests on the shoulders of these great, great astronomers. And my favorite, my absolute favorite, is Johannes Kepler. He was a mathematician, he was an astronomer, he was an astrologer. Let me remind you of the three laws of planetary dynamics. Hmm? Anybody know the first law is simple? Hmm? Hmm? Planets rotate around us. Elliptical plane? An elliptical plane. Okay, that's law number one. Law number two. Uh, you're gonna have to answer. All right. Scooping out equal areas and equal times. Okay. What does it mean? What Bill's trying to say to you is that as an object goes around the sun, it slows down and then whoops around, increases the speed, and decreases, increases, whoops around. Yeah, that's, you know, it turns out to be an ellipse, a slightly flattened circle. Yeah, it's elliptical, yeah, uh -huh. sure. I mean, the most, very few objects are attacked in a perfect circle. Uh -huh. uh, and most of them have got two axes, a semi-major axis, which is the bigger axis and the semi-minor axis. And that leads us to the third law, Kepler's third law, which he worked out without a calculator. He had no little calculator or computer. He worked out the third law, which holds today. Hmm. The third law was simple. He said that the that a cube was proportional to the inverse of p squared without, without a computer. Mm. What is that? Periodicity, how long it takes for an object to go around the sun is periodicity in years. 
is proportional, that, that square is proportional to the inverse, 1 over the semi-major axis cubed. Hmm? <laughs> okay, so P squared equals 1 is proportional to 1 over, sorry, yeah, P squared equals 1 over A cubed. How did computer and what did he do to use the observation of, of Tycho Brahe, which we we're going to discuss shortly, the observational work that had been done, and he did this mathematically, he solved that mathematically, and it's to this day it holds. <coughs> Newton used his maths to progress it even further, to put math, maths in the equation as well. But wow, what a giant! What an intellectual giant, a mathematical genius. Took him five years, mind you. That's <laughs> five years. <coughs> Absolutely amazing. What an what an interesting guy. So there's a there's a great mind, okay? But let me tell you, he was a well recognized astrologer. He not only produced eight hundred horoscopes, most likely to supplement his income. You couldn't make a buck out of astronomy, okay? You had to make your money out of astrology. So he produced horoscopes for himself as well, which suggests that he really believed in it. I mean, he, they were his personal horoscopes. Um, and he'd say, good night, he'd do it for money, but he cast these horoscopes for himself. He was convinced that the planetary configurations affected humans as well as the weather. And he was quite famous, he prognosticated um, he forecast a, a peasant uprising. Uh, there was the Tur Turkish invasion, which he predicted. Um, and also there was a time when uh, they had the opposite of global warming and it would, got very cold and he predicted that. Um, Day Cometus uh, Lib Libelli Trays was his work and it's full of his astrological predictions. He has a giant mathematical scientist who absolutely believed in, in astrology. Later we can discuss why we think that happened. Tycho Brahe, now I should have put him first because he came before uh, Johannes Kepler, because Kepler used the work of Brahe um, to develop the mathematical models, but Brahe was not uh, a great mathematician. He was a great observational astronomer. Uh, he had an observatory, he looked at the sky, and he documented in great detail, he documented the movement of um, everything. Uh, have a look at this, it's interesting. Look at his nose. Famous picture, especially of his nose. Mm. What happened is that as a young student uh, at that time, if you had an argument, you would have a duel. He did have a duel with another um, another student about a woman, I understand, and he lost his nose in the in the dueling, and he wore an artificial covering uh, for his nose. You can see it there quite quite clearly. He cut his nose to save his face. Hmm? He spied his face. Cut his nose. He cut the... Cut save his face. He cut the tip of his nose off. Mm. Um, he was Danish. Um, problem with him also, though, he, even though he was an observational astronomer, he believed in the geocentric system. He believed that the Earth was the center of the solar system and everything revolved around it. And can you blame him, actually? You know, you go outside, you stand there, and you see the sun coming up that side, and it moves over and goes down there. That was the intuitive thing, it was the natural thing to say, wow, you know, we're the center of everything, we're not moving. 
and you look around, you see the stars moving, you see the planets moving, you see the sun and the moon. Everything's moving, except us. Uh, he designed all these systems uh, uh, based on the geocentric. Geocentric means the Earth is the center compared to a heliocentric, which is the sun at the center. Now, Brahe believed there was a connection between empiricism, which is experimentation, and religion and astrology. An interesting thing happens with him, though, is that he publishes his stuff in the names of his assistants. He was a little bit worried about astrology, so he doesn't actually publish his work in his own name. He publishes his work in the name of his assistants, just in case there was a comeback, okay? And it's suggesting there was some ambiguity in his mind. He wasn't totally sure. This didn't make total sense. Uh, he may have lost faith in the horoscopic astrology. It was a very interesting, very interesting guy, actually. He died, uh, um, I'd say, because he was invited to dinner at the, um, at the, the Danish king. Uh, in, in, it was, the dinner was thrown in his honor. Um, his bladder got full, no doubt, from drinking a lot of wine, but it was impolite to excuse yourself from the table of the king. So he sat through it. Eventually his bladder burst and he died from peritonitis and his, uh, his, uh, his bladder bursting. Yeah, it wasn't actually the Danish king, it was the Holy Roman Emperor. <coughs> he was working for him in Prague at the time. So. Thank you for that correction. And uh, anyone else who wants to correct me, you're welcome to, but do it afterwards. Now you all who astronomer, a mathematician, he was an engineer, and he was a very famous astrologer. Who knew that? Who knew that Galileo was an astrologer? Hmm? Well, what got him into trouble was the heliocentric thing. I mean, he was incarcerated because he followed Copernicus's teaching um, that the sun was the center of our solar system. That's heliocentric. And that's why he was, was against the doctrine of the church, and that's why he was eventually imprisoned or hung, imprisoned or hung, um, because he was uh, spouting the Copernican uh, viewpoint. Uh, of all the ancient astronomers, his contribution was enormous. I mean. We could spend three sessions just speaking about his work in the Jupiter, the Galilean moons named after him, um, work on Venus and Saturn and Neptune. Um, he wrote extensively on sunspots, um, eventually went blind. It wasn't because he was looking through the telescope at the sun, which of course you mustn't do, um, but uh, he probably had glaucoma, I think. Anyway, uh, not at the brightest time of the day, so it didn't damage his eyes. Mm. But he wrote on the moon, um, the Milky Way, <coughs> and I've just put there, etc., 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 because the, the list goes on and on and on. What a genius of a man! Absolute genius. But now the interesting part he actually he qualified in medicine, first of all, he became a doctor. The day he became a doctor, he stopped practicing medicine. He never, his father wanted him to be a doctor, and his father knew the right thing. He said to him, you need to do medicine because there's more money in it. Okay. His father was right. But Galileo 
had no interest in medicine. Went to the University of Padua, studied medicine, and then left and became the, his, his love was mathematics. Um, and he taught medical students astronomy and astrology at the University of Padua. I understand that he's got his, his fingers are involved. That's right. And involved at the University of Padua. Like I, I have his fingers there. So he taught medical students to cast the horoscope. The, the irony of it, you know, practiced, he learned medicine but never practiced medicine. Um, and then he ends up actually teaching astrology to medical students because they had to know it. He was, he was renowned as an astrologer. They accused him of predicting the death of the Pope from astrological charts that he had worked out. But I mean, that's a striking thing. It's a very interesting slide there because he has a great mind that contributes major to astronomy and we see the strong pull of astrology in their life and their work. All right. Let's give you some interesting stuff. Shakespeare is full of astrology. Mm -hmm. Almost all his works have got some reference to astrology. Dante um, writes about it. Chaucer, Marlowe, contemporaries, um, all have an interest or have comments in their work um, about astrology. So it was a big, big thing at that time. Let's take this a little bit more closer to home. Alan Morcatton, who's, who's read the luminaries? Anyone read the luminaries? Okay, big book. <laughs> 800 and some pages. Um, and she won the uh, Man Booker Award um, in 2013 for her work on the luminaries. And the whole luminaries revolves around astrology. <coughs> The 12 main characters are all signs from the zodiac. And then the chapters get shorter and shorter as, as a spiral based on astrological thinking. I mean, she is, she is a famous New Zealand uh, author. Brilliant. So what happens in 2014 at the Auckland Readers and Writers Festival. My wife dragged me along and to listen to her speak about her book. And well, she spoke well. She's very eloquent and a uh, well spoken young uh, author. And she spoke about the topic and about the book. And then, if any of you have been to the Readers and Writers Festival, Aotea Centre, at the end of the talk, the audience get an opportunity to ask questions. I'm sitting in the audience, and someone astutely, astutely puts up their hand and says, I don't know, um, you write a lot about astrology. What is your personal view? 2014, I must remind you, right? says to her, what's your personal view about astrology? And well, she said to the whole audience, there must have been 500 people, I believe, at least five, she said, no, there's something in it, I believe in it. Hmm? New Zealand author believes in it. Yep. Oh no, no, just scratching. You were scratching your head. <laughs> 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 I'm going to pick on you now. <laughs> okay, we see it in music. Uh, Gustav Holtz um, wrote in 1918. Planets was all an astrological music piece. 
Um, and then the New Zealand composer, Edwin Cobb, wrote the, the 12 signs, an astrological entertainment for orchestra without strings. Again, based heavily on astrology. So we see it inculcating our literature, our music. This is a topic I've been interested in, uh, mainly because of this guy, oops, here he is, Hippocrates, 460 BC, the father of modern medicine, and Hippocrates, and I'm quoting directly from him, a doctor without astrology is a doctor who is blind, those are his exact words. <laughs> shows you a little bit about this is the origin of modern medicine came from Hippocrates and this is what he's, what he's teaching us medical schools were, school, were called schools of medicine and astrology that mm -hmm. was the name he went to medical school he actually went to medical school and astrology school it was the same uh, thing uh, the zodiac body this, this picture here uh, each sign of the zodiac is associated with different parts of the body and used extensively in astrological medicine. Who knows what that is? Astrolabe. Astrolabe. Astrolabe was a, it was a mechanical computer, um, Islamic in origin. Um, and used to calculate the position of the planets, the stars, and it had different disks on it, and you would curl, turn these disks to align things and work out uh, where the stars were, what position. Uh, but the medical astrolabe was actually used one of these astrolabes and had on it extra little disks which you could dial in, and depending on your fever, depending on what your symptoms were, um, you could dial in and you could work out what medication to use, when to use it, relating to the position of the moon or the stars. So you would choose your, your medicine, the doctor would choose the medicine, depending on how it actually related to the celestial bodies. Amazing computer, first mechanical computer, so it wasn't electronic. That was the medical astronaut. And right up until the 17th century, even beyond it, um, astrological medicine still thrived. And people <coughs> believed in it in a big, big way. An interesting area because it's influenced our lives. There she is, uh, gorgeous Nancy Reagan, uh, wife and confidant of Ronald Reagan. And she commissioned Joan Quigley, uh, who became the White House astrologer in the 1980s. That's not so long ago, eh? Most of you, well, half of you, I presume. We were born by that time. Hmm? And yeah, the most powerful country in the world is being influenced by an astrologer. I mean, major political decisions are made by an astrologer because he listened to his wife, hmm? as they all wish we would do. and influenced international politics. She was only kicked out once they discovered, um, uh, they discovered that there was an astrologer in the White House. She was actually in the White House. And she was making predictions that were used by Ronald Reagan for world affairs. One wonders what Trump was using. <laughs> <laughs> Himself. <laughs> now, Adolf Hitler also had an astrologer, uh, Louis de Vaux, um, 
she fires him because he's got a lot of things wrong with this. You know, one thing right that <laughs> Germany would lose the war. Uh, but it influenced a lot of the decision making um, of Hitler. I want to take this to a little more, a little more recent. In 2011, in India, the High Court upholds that astrology is a science. 2011. Hmm? Eight years ago, <coughs> India's High Court decrees that astrology is a science. 1950s, 1960s, um, they, in California, they mooted um, that astrology should be board certified. You know, if you become a doctor or anything in America, you have to have board certification. So there was a, a, a debate um, in California on whether they should make this make the practice of astrology, um, whether they should, they should make it board certified. I mean, that's the 1950s. That's not so long ago. Interesting in Japan is interesting. In the year of the fire horse, it was thought that it was a bad year to have a baby. The fertility rate in the year of the fire horse dropped by 25% in that year. That's absolutely amazing. And conversely, the abortion rate went up significantly in that very year just because of the belief that it was a bad year to have, to have a child. Vietnam, I worked in Vietnam um, over several, uh, several sessions and um, I lectured there. And when I first got there, I, just, I noticed, just without discussing it with anyone, that the caesarean section rate was actually quite, quite high. You know, Vietnam was, was not the developed world, the developing world. And yet, yeah, there was a significantly higher than New Zealand. New Zealand now, the caesarean rate is quite high, 30% plus. Um, it was higher than 30% in Vietnam uh, 14, 10, 15 years ago striking. Uh, there were some interesting variations on it. It seemed to be that the Caesar rate was much higher on the 8th of every month, on the 18th of every month, or the 28th of every month, 8th being a lucky number. And how else can you ensure that you deliver on a particular day you can only do that by having a caesarean section, of course. So that was one of the reasons. The other was the belief that you had a, and, and your baby would be uh, more clever if you had a caesarean section. But I suspect it was a, a secondary or an afterthought. People would go to the fortune, their fortune tellers and use astrological means to decide on which was the best day to deliver the baby and then influence their caregiver, their obstetrician, to ensure that they would deliver by caesarean section on that day. Still happens to this day, I'm told. Interesting. Our astrology influences our lives. 